How's it dudes? Modular phones. Created as an idea to combat repairability in phones, the concept has never truly made it off the ground. Multiple models have been designed, going as far to get a release date, but a completely customizable modular phone has never reached the consumer's hand. So what happened? How did this once promising product completely disappear? In 2009, an Israeli company called Modu had developed and even released a concept of a phone that could expand its capabilities with removable jackets, giving it GPS, an MP3 player, a camera, or a keyboard. Given that most phones at the time could already do all of those things at once, it never fully took off. But the real momentum started in 2013, a video launched on YouTube introducing the concept of a fully modular phone and it presents some novel ideas. Titled Phone Blocks, the narrator describes the current landscape of devices. When something breaks, you either expensively repair it or you replace the whole thing. You then throw away the old device, even the bit that still works fine. This not only makes the whole process incredibly pricey for the consumer, but adds to global waste at an alarming rate. This makes electronic waste one of the fastest growing waste streams in the world, and our phone is one of the biggest causes. He proposed a new type of phone, one with modularity and repair in mind. This whole design and video was the idea of this guy, Dave Hackens. As his senior project, the Dutch designer made a model out of solid aluminum and created a product launch video to spread the word. Using a site called Thunderclap, the video looked to gather as much support as possible. The plan was simple. If enough people liked the product idea, then brands would begin buying in and developing a product. The video showed a phone that could be customized to the user's liking, helped by hypothetical modules produced by all sorts of brands. PhoneBlocks was a collaborative product, and they wanted all sorts of companies and individuals to design their own modules on the final product. This concept, while not entirely new, saw huge popularity. The video got 1 million views in just 24 hours, and now sits at 22 million. The slogan was, a phone worth keeping, and it really seemed like that. I mean, just imagine it. It would cost a lot to develop the system, so the upfront cost would be high in comparison to what we know today. But after that, it would just be a completely different experience. So if, for instance, your phone is getting a little slow, you can just upgrade the block that affects the speed. Or if something breaks, you can easily replace it with a new one, or update it with the latest version. Not only would repairs be cheaper, but upgrades as well. The phone would be an evolving product that was always up to date. It would stay with you for essentially forever, held up by the support of many companies developing new modules. It's a real ship of Theseus problem, but honestly, this device was just plain cool. You could have any kind of phone you wanted. Big screen, more speakers, bigger battery, the possibilities were endless. Like I said, the internet went nuts. The PhoneBlocks website crashed almost immediately. A bunch of celebrities were tweeting, you get it. They launched a separate channel and a pitch video, showing a whole ecosystem of upgradable and interchangeable Lego-like devices. While touring and looking for sponsors, Dave and his team quickly started winning awards and contracts. Dave didn't really have the resources to make this happen, so other brands started reaching out to him. They partnered with Sennheiser to make an audio module, and then Motorola reached out. Motorola, recently acquired by Google, had a special development team. ATAP, or Advanced Technology and Projects, was like a phone version of NASA, using Google funding to build just some of the coolest shit out there. They revealed to the world Project Aura, which apparently they had been working on for a while now. In fact, they had bought up patents from that earlier Modu phone back in 2011 to help with this modular phone idea. They already had a full prototype and quickly showed it off to the world. Dave and his team at PhoneBlocks worked closely with them, but kept it as separate businesses, with the hopes of inspiring a whole industry. While other prototypes did come out, Aura was by far the most modular and furthest along. The ZTE Eco Mobius had four replaceable components, and then there was the Xiaomi Magic Cube. Interestingly enough, Xiaomi actually released a Rubik's Cube called the Magic Cube, so it's just kind of hard to find stuff about it. Okay, now that the seed has been planted, it's only a matter of time before one of these products makes it to the market, right? Well, not exactly. This whole concept was proving more difficult than originally expected. Martin Cooper, the creator of the cell phone back in the 70s, gave an interview to CNN, and he had some pretty good points. The main reason that the phone block will not hit the market is it will cost more, be bigger and heavier, and be less reliable. By the time it could be brought to market, the problem that engendered it will be gone. Now, I'm not sure about that last part. E-waste is still a pretty huge problem 12 years later but he did get that first part right. The first cell phone was a huge deal for manufacturing, so Dr. Cooper had some experience. By the way, I talked about the whole story of how the first phone was made in that video right there. Simply designing this sort of modular product would prove incredibly difficult and expensive, not to mention manufacturing. When all the components are close together on a regular phone, they work faster and take up less space. 
they also work more efficiently. Designing a hub for a device where components could be placed anywhere and further apart, that would create a lot of issues. It would be larger, heavier, use more materials, and may have poor performance. Most importantly, it would probably end up being way more expensive for the consumer. These were all problems that would need to be solved or improved, and so far it looked like Aura was the closest to doing that. And they got really close. So let's talk about Aura. Aura was a very advanced project within Google's ATAP team, and what they were trying to do was build something completely new. The prototypes shown in the initial interviews with Verge were awesome. The frame, or endoskeleton, had practically no components in it. Everything was replaceable. The modules slid in and out using a sort of rail system, and they seemed to come in all sorts of fun colors and prints. This was a truly customizable phone at its greatest form, but their design wasn't necessarily the final product. They were simply designing the prototype to be handed off to Google. They weren't making a consumer device, they were just proving that the tech worked. But this was no easy task. Led by Paul Iromenko, I'm so sorry by the way if I got that wrong, they were integrating all sorts of new stuff into their design that had never been seen before. Their platform was more than just a phone. They were redesigning the entire phone landscape from the ground up. As Verge put it, Aramenko and his small team aren't just building a series of proof-of-concept prototypes, they're attempting to build an industry within an industry. The product was completely customizable, just like the original goal, and they were using some clever methods to get around some of the major hurdles. For one, they were investing in 3D printing architecture and working closely with many other engineering firms, including PhoneBlocks, to make manufacturing very cheap. The 3D printers they designed were supposedly one of a kind. They believed their phone could be designed cheap and repairable enough to make mobile computing accessible to the 5 billion people who didn't already have a phone. To get over the speed hurdle, they hoped to implement a new Unipro communication standard, which at the time wasn't implemented in any devices. Quote, Aramenko says that once Unipro is utilized by modules, an Aura phone should be fast enough to overcome that speed issue, thanks to 10 gigabits of throughput to most modules from the on-device network with a couple microsecond latency. That's good enough for things like storage and cellular radios, but not good enough for RAM, which will need to be on the same module as the processor. These ATAP guys are like really freaking smart. It's a lot of technical details, so if you're into that kind of thing, Go check out the article and watch the video, it's linked down in the sources. What Paul and his team were trying to do was incredibly hard, but what was even crazier is they only had one year left to do it. The team internal to Google is very, very small, very, very lean, um, and uh, and we're here for a very short period of time. So uh, I, have, I had a two-year tenure, I'm one year into my two-year tenure. Um, the project is scoped uh, to the team's tenure. Um, and as a consequence, uh, the, the philosophy is that time is not your friend. Their prototype was called Spiral One, and they improved it gradually over the following months. All the videos and press conferences from both the phone blocks and the Aura team showed this super positive collaborative vibe, with everyone pitching in ideas for modules. Their developer conferences happened frequently and all over the globe. People built prototypes out of household supplies and, most of all, Legos. Even within ATAP, the Aura team brainstormed using bricks, like modules, snapping into place. At Google I.O. 2015, ATAP got their own hour and a half long presentation. By now, they had had a year of making cool prototypes and using experimental technology. As the vice president put it, they'd become known as a small band of pirates trying to do epic shit. I mean, look at their logo. While teasing it the entire presentation, they ended the whole thing with a live demo of their Spiral 2 prototype. If there was any doubt before this, it was now clear they had a fully working model. Live in front of the audience, the presenter snapped a camera onto the device and took a picture. The reveal went nuts online, and it was quickly followed up by an announcement to start rolling out testing units in Puerto Rico. There were some official ads for the phone, it got super close, but then the Spiral 2 never released. Announcements were carried out on their Twitter page that the product was delayed. The project was seemingly handed off to Google's development team, and the next big mention was I.O. the next year. While Spiral 1 and 2 looked quite similar, this new version was a bit different. They announced they would release a developer's kit late in 2016, with a consumer version in 2017. All you had to do to get it that fall was fill out a form with your plans to develop a module. At this point, Wired claimed that versions were already being employed as a main phone by up to 30 Google employees. The design had become a little more integrated, with major parts like the chip, antenna, battery, and display built into the endoskeleton. This meant that the phone shipped performing well, but future upgrades and repairs to performance would require replacing the whole frame. 
The modules did not slide in anymore. There was a more satisfying snap into place. They were then locked in and could be ejected easily when you wanted to remove them. And you did that either in the settings or via voice command. This was a much more secure way for the tiles to work. The modules were now practically corner to corner without the rails, making them a little bigger and they definitely looked a lot cleaner too. However, the modules now only had six slots and if you wanted to use a double wide module, you had even less. While basic performance was locked, there was now much more space for customizable modules. Cameras, extra storage, cool widgets, and many more were shown. They revealed plans to keep upgrading the endoskeleton while keeping the module compatibility, so you could replace your phone but keep a few customizations you liked. It wasn't quite the original vision of complete interchangeability, but it was still looking pretty cool. The module development potential and proposed future of expansion for the product was amazing. The ad pitched not just a sustainable phone, but a customizable lifestyle. And then, silence. By September, they announced that they had shut down the product. In my research, I couldn't find any of their Twitter announcements. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're all deleted. That just means that I can't find stuff on Twitter because the UI is abysmal. But as far as I can tell, the entire page has been wiped. The cancellation was probably because of the departure from the original goal. In the process of making a more mainstream design, they ended up looping around and making a thicker smartphone with very few interchangeable elements. Yes, it was clear the potential was still there, but they pulled the plug before they could ever reach that potential. The planned product supposedly didn't get enough public support. Phone Blocks posted a somber video with more renders of a potential modular device ecosystem. They ended the video with, don't give up. And with that, the industry's best chance at a fully modular phone was gone. But there's still some other cool stuff that came out, so let's take a look at that. Okay, all those other prototypes I talked about in chapter one never took off, but there were a couple more in 2015. The Shift phone was a German designed modular phone that as far as I can tell actually made it to market. There's not a lot of documentation, very few reviews, and Wikipedia can't decide which product came first. So honestly, I don't know how good it was. If you live in Germany or anywhere else for that matter and you've ever had a Shift phone, I'd really like to know what it was like down below. There's like not a lot of documentation. So seriously, let me know. Okay, next up is the very famous Fairphone. Initially launched in 2015, they are now up to version five. Yeah, I'll be honest, I've almost bought this phone on like several occasions. Designed around ethicality and sustainability, this device was not just endlessly repairable, but ethically sourced. Recycled parts all around. It offers more years of software upgrades than any other phone, meaning you can really use it for much longer than a standard phone. Each replaceable part is less of a module and more of just like a part of a normal phone that happens to be hot swappable. Each one is available for cheap on the website and I fix it along with repair guides and like the most you need is a screwdriver. The components themselves are a little old, especially the processor, which wasn't even meant for a phone, but everything can literally be replaced in like five minutes. You end up with a device that runs just a little slow and isn't up to par. Speaking of old fashioned though, there is a lot going on here that's less, oh, quaint and more, what year is it? I can't remember the last time I did a phone review and I felt like I needed to have a performance and responsiveness section. I mean, maybe I've been spoiled by more premium devices, but the Fairphone 5 really did feel more like my ancient Note 9 than a modern phone. I don't count the Fairphone as a fully modular phone though, Admittedly, my definition is a little arbitrary, but I'm basing it off that original phone blocks video. Nearly every part of the phone is replaceable, yes, but it's only for repair. You can't upgrade or customize the phone in any meaningful capacity, or at least no more than a standard phone. Meaning it's pretty much locked to this look with these specs. The goal of this is just to keep you on the same phone for as long as possible, one that is notably already slow. Yeah, let me clarify. I feel that a modular phone isn't just defined by its ability of replacement, for repair purposes. It should also be able to be upgraded and personalized to the user's liking. It's kind of like the original vision of the phone blocks video. Products like the Fairphone and all the HMD phones that are coming out right now, those are cool, but I don't think that they're modular phones because they're more just about the right to repair. There's nothing about personalization or upgrading over time. Right to repair is a whole nother video. And in fact, I have made a video about it. It was a really long time ago, but these new HMD phones are really cool because every single part can be taken out and replaced in like less than five minutes with a single screwdriver. So worth a mention, but not quite modular. Okay, back to the video. The phone isn't particularly cheap either. It's not too expensive, just not budget. For a non-power user who has a little extra cash, this is an excellent choice for those who are worried about their environmental impact. But with the Fairphone 6 just right around the corner, it's coming out on Wednesday, I would just hold off for a little bit and see if the Fairphone 5 gets cheaper or if you like the 6 better or check out that HMD phone I talked about. They're all the same idea. Next up, this thing. I talked about it in that video. The LG G5 had a hot swappable battery and Jason Statham? It had one peripheral that you could attach to get camera controls, but at launch, that was it. The idea was to carry two batteries so you could swap them out. 
but that just made it like a modern version of a 2000 Nokia, not a modular phone. The LG G5 with modular design, the first phone built for fun. A couple other phones have included easily replaceable attachments since then. Most notably, of course, is the Essential Phone made by Andy Rubin. He's the guy that Android is named after, you know, he made it. It had magnetic attachable components, not unlike the Moto Z. It was a whole line of Motorola phones that came with this like detachable attachment on the back. This one's a speaker. And of course, who could forget the Red Hydrogen 1? I could. That's why I'm doing it in voiceover. In recent years, many phones have adopted a little more of a sustainable strategy. Why would you make the components of the phone hot swappable? if you could just make it easier to repair. Most major Android phone makers, as well as Apple, have adopted pull tabs for their batteries, as well as many other features. That is, of course, except for the Google Pixel. I don't know why they've done this, but for some reason, Google is now at the back of the pack for repairability. So yeah, overall, the modular phone is just kind of a great idea that died out in 2017. The customizable and the upgradable factor of it has just fallen to the wayside, while the repairability has become a major focus for almost all phones. The PhoneBlocks website is still active, as far as I can tell, and they're still trying to get the ball rolling on this idea. Their YouTube stopped making modular phone videos back in 2016 though, with one last phone block update on Dave's personal channel in 2018. So I had this idea for a modular phone, one that you can upgrade and replace broken parts. And then Google came, wanting to do it in two years, called Project Ara. Every time I dropped by, it got smaller and smaller. Until in the end, a proper phone. I mean, it really worked. It booted, it could make pictures, swap modules out, Super impressive. But then the company decided to focus more on software. Boom, project gone. Unfortunately, there was really only one major candidate and it just kind of fizzled out. It's a really great idea that kind of redefines what we think of as the smartphone. Personally, I think it's like really amazing and I'm looking forward to a future where we might implement it. But I'm pretty sure that Google still retains ownership of Project Aura. So Project Aura 2, anyone? All right. Thanks to all my members listed right there. You guys are awesome. I have an Instagram. You can check me out at owencook.mp4. I have more videos just like this one. And party on, dudes.